All right. Thank you all for coming. Um, this is the session about advanced configuration management with configuration split and similar modules. I'm Fabian Bircher or uh, Bircher on Drupal.org. Um, I work for Nuvole, a 100% Drupal company. Well, we also do um, other things with Silex and Symfony since Drupal 8 adopted these kind of things. Um, we are a distributed team in Belgium, Italy, and the Czech Republic. Um, our clients are mostly international organizations and institutions, and um, they have a need often for fast delivery, so we have several developers working on the same projects, and um, we need to frequently um, update sites. And I'm pretty sure this matches um, almost all of your uh, experience as well. Um, so we need a safe way to manage the configuration between different instances of the same site of, of the project. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so the first chapter is about, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> this <laughs> Twitter notifications is not going to happen. <laughs> Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so the first chapter is about uh, configuration management in Drupal Core. As you may know, Drupal 8 has this amazing new feature of configuration management. And it is really great and we love it. Um, but the use case Drupal Core covers um, is kind of limited. And uh, so often we, we have uh, more needs. Um, but nevertheless, the, the core scenario is um, answers the questions of how I can develop and test configuration on a development copy and keep this site running at the same time, and then export the configuration changes and import them on the live site uh, in production. And that's it. So um, I will, this is not exactly the same presentation as I gave before. Um, I will try to um, explain the concepts uh, so that then you can adapt them to your own needs. And so the configuration management in core works essentially around configuration storage. I will use the same um, kind of um, pictures for, for all the things. So this square with the slightly rounded corners represents a configuration storage. The blue here, the Drupal blue, is the active storage. That's the one. Um, when your Drupal site is functioning, reads the configuration from. By default, uh, it is in the database. So that has uh, several reasons. One of them is that you don't go in and just change stuff, because when configuration changes, um, other fields uh, or other database tables also have to be updated. And it's also faster to read from. You can read the configuration from it, and you can get configuration to read in a form and save it back to, to this database. Um, there is also a caching layer involved and, and a, a lot more um, advanced things, but this, this is the basic concept. Um, I put the little asterisk on the reading. We will get to that uh, later because there, there is a, a layer in between that allows for, for overrides. And that's also why the writing operation has a separate read arrow, right? So, so all good. The next step is the, to synchronize the configuration. So you have this active storage, and you have another configuration storage, which is backed by files, the sync storage. And you can export the configuration, which you can do either by downloading the tarball or with Rush or Drupal console. And basically what it does is it removes all the configuration from the files, deletes all the files, reads all the active configuration, and writes all the configuration to the files again. The import configuration is slightly more advanced um, because it doesn't just wipe the active configuration. It makes a diff and sees what is new and what is uh, old or what, what should be deleted and adds the ones that um, 
are new and removes the ones that are not in the files anymore. And then also updates all the other database tables, um, like for the fields, when, when you add new fields and so on. So when you uh, deploy configuration or you manage the configurations between different environments, you have in one environment um, these two database, uh, these two configuration storages, the database and the files. So you click around in the UI and you build your site, this site builder um, track after all. Then you export the configuration to the files, you add the files to Git, you on the other environment you pull the files and you import the uh, configuration. Of course, this also works the other way around, so you can have several developers and you synchronize the configuration over Git as, as you do with the other code that you develop. Um, all great, right? Um, the configuration management in Drupal 8 core works perfectly for this use case. Um, but we need to cover a couple of more things. When I, when I showed you this, um, actually the database has to be the, the same. It has to be copied from before. You cannot just import into an empty database. And um, this is what the next uh, chapter is about, is in installing from existing configuration. It's a very important step. Um, and it's for bootstrapping another environment of the same site that you installed before. Um, there's a contrib project, it's an installation profile called config installer, and it creates um, a, a site, another instance of the same site. Usually when you uh, go through the Drupal installer and you, you install a profile like standard or minimal or your own, it creates a new site. Uh, with the configuration installer, um, it's just used to install the existing site and um, not, and then after the uh, site is installed, the configuration installer is, is not used anymore. Um, we use it in all our projects, and um, so should you, or actually Corm. It even has a nice UI, so uh, you can upload the tarball that you downloaded from um, the other site, so it, you don't need the command line for that, but of course it also works with uh, the command line. Um, there's two issues to add this functionality to core. Um, profiles at the moment, the, the API of a, of a profile um, was never meant to be reinstalled. So, for example, profiles, they can have dependencies, but you can uninstall the dependencies. And that really makes no sense. I mean, you, you have a dependency, but then it's not a dependency. And so th this creates a lot of problems when you want to um, bootstrap a site from from, with a profile that is like has a dependency but not, and so um, there's two issues that try to to solve this, and uh, I hope we can get them rolling uh, during this week again uh, more. Um, another thing that uh, is already in core but is kind of outside this use case um, is, for example, if you want to uh, differentiate the environments and. Simple examples are uh, error logging to verbose on, on your development environment or API keys on production that you don't want to add to Git. And uh, you can do that um, with core and uh, there, there's different mechanisms for overriding configuration. The easiest one is using the config variable in uh, settings.php. Um, so basically you just add this this override in settings.php, um, the system logging and you set the error log, uh, level to verbose. And, and that's it. And you could also do that with API keys. Um, to go back to our, our graphics, this, th this is where this arrow um, comes in. So basically you read from the configuration from the database, but then you read the overrides and you you use the overridden um, configuration in like the site title or, or wherever you use the configuration. Um, 
that's all great, but it has a couple of shortcomings. Um, one of them is that you can only alter existing configuration uh, using this method, and you cannot add new configuration to it or unset completely other configuration. Um, and you cannot, for example, uh, change which modules are enabled. Uh, and, and a couple of other things, like you can't uh, overwrite the color of Bartik this way. Um, yeah, so um, can we do better? Can we do more? And uh, this is where the configuration filter module comes in. Um, so this is the schema of configuration management. Um, and magic, this is the configuration management with the configuration filter. You can see the only thing that changed is this um, sync storage. So instead of writing directly to the file, you write to this magic configuration filter storage. Um, configuration filters or config filter, the module provides configuration filters. Um, and filters are like a glorified alter hook uh, for the configuration uh, storage. So you, they can apply, they can change the data for every operation that you can do on a, uh, on a configuration storage. Um, filters are plugins, or can be plugins, and the plugins are sorted by weight and then applied after each other. So they, they're daisy-chained, and the data that goes into one filter and then comes out goes into the next filter and, and so on, and at the end gets written to the uh, storage, or and the other way around, first gets written, then passed to all the filters, and then gets passed back to Drupal. Uh, plugins can be active or inactive. The inactive plugins, they, they're just defined, but they're not used, so they're, they're just skipped. Um, the modules uh, right now has more than 6,000 sites using it uh, or reporting to use it, and it's uh, one of the top 100 modules right now, and has zero bugs. Well, <laughs> Not exactly. There was one bug that um, someone reported after I refactored the code, um, but it turned out that the APCU cache was turned on. And this is because the, the, the API of this module, the, the interface that it interacts with Drupal is really small. Like, it doesn't do anything else. It doesn't affect the running of the site except for the synchronization storage. It, that's the only thing it does. It replaces the storage and other modules provide the, the filters for it. So let's unveil the, the magic and look, look behind the, this configuration filter storage. And uh, as you can see, the, there is the, the green uh, uh, file storage again from before, the, the original um, sync storage. And before and after the data goes in and out, um, filters are applied. Um, High-level um, example of this is, for example, with configuration split, where configuration split has a secondary uh, file storage and splits the storage, uh, splits the configuration between the main one and the secondary one. Another example is the config ignore, uh, which basically, when you read the configuration, um, you read it from the active storage and therefore uh, it's the same as the one you already have and therefore there's no diff and therefore the configuration is ignored. Um, this presentation is also meant as a documentation for configuration split. Um, a lot of people have said that it's a bit complicated sometimes and that there's a lot of options and it's not really clear what they do and how they work and um, you have to find out, but then you don't know if you did it correctly or, or what. So let, we will go here now through the, um, the different options that you have to configure it. So uh, the first part, there, there's three field sets. The first part is the static settings and where you have the folder. So you, you specify the directory um, of the secondary configuration storage and the, you can use an absolute path or a relative path to the Drupal root the, the same way you configure the um, 
sync storage in settings.php. It's the, the same kind of way. Um, if you leave it empty, it will use um, a separate specialized database storage for this split. Um, you can have multiple splits, of course, and then they get um, used one after the other, depending on, on the weight. And the split can be active or not. And all of these uh, you can override in settings.php with the normal configuration override mechanism that I showed you before. So for example, uh, we will get to that in a second. Uh, the next section is the complete split, also known as the blacklist. Um, I still might refer to that um, when, when we talk, um, because that's what it was named for a, for a long time. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm still very used to blacklist and graylist, but it's now named uh, complete split and uh, conditional split. So the complete split has a, um, an option to specify modules. And what happens is when the configuration goes through it, so there's the, the list of enabled modules is specified in core.extensions. And when you export the configuration, what, what the split does is it removes the module that you specify here and saves them in the configuration of the split. And so they, they're removed from, from core data extension as it goes on. And when, when you read from it, it, it adds them again. Um, it also automatically detects all the configuration that depends on these modules, because the configuration that depend on modules that are not enabled don't make sense. So it also moves them away and puts them in, in the secondary storage. And um, there, there's basically two ways. One is a, um, a select, where with chosen the UI is very nice, and the other one is a text area uh, that you can use to uh, use wildcards, for example. So you can you can select a, a whole array of uh, configuration. Um, in in the end, both of them are the same. If you write the configuration name in the text area, it, it's the same as the the drop down. Um, the conditional split, or formerly known as gray list, has the same kind of way to um, select the configuration. And important to know here is that this configuration will not be deleted when you export it. I mentioned in the very beginning, the way the export works is you delete all the configuration, and then you read it and write it again. But the conditional split, um, does what it, what it does is it checks if it's different than the one you already have ex exported. But to check whether it's different, the thing still needs to exist. So uh, it doesn't get deleted. And this has an uh, important application we will see in a uh, second. Um, then there's a, a checkbox for de uh, dependent configuration. You can select to also uh, find all the configuration that depends on the configuration that you listed, and uh, conditionally split that too. And there's a checkbox for split only when different. So then it checks and uh, it, um, it splits only uh, when, when the things are, are actually different. And this is useful when, when using wildcards. So you, you have like block placements, and then one of the block placements changed, but you don't want to split off all the block placements, but only the ones that are not the same as you, you want to deploy from the thing. Um, there's a CLI commands, the config split import and the config split export. Um, if you use them without an argument, they're the replacement for uh, the Drush commands prior to 8.1.10 and for Drupal console. And if you use them with an argument, you use them with an argument of the, the machine name of the split and then it will import or export only that specific split and will leave the rest of the configuration alone. Um, so that was all theoretical. Let's, let's look at an example. So we have three configuration names. Let's call them A, B, and C. A for not being listed in, in the configuration at all. B for the configuration listed as a complete split, so the first part that might be a module or, or something like that, and C, the conditional split. Um, 
Obviously, it's very simplified, <laughs> but you, I think you, you'll understand. So let's um, write, when, let, let's export. Um, A, what happens? It goes through the filter, it, it gets passed along as it is. Let's try to write B. It will go in the secondary storage and it will not get passed on to, to the next filter or the other storage because it gets split apart. Uh, C, here we assume it, it already existed in the exported configuration. Uh, if it doesn't, it's the same as if it would be different. So if it already exists, it, it didn't get removed. So when, you, when we export it, it just passes it on. Uh, if you look at the reading, it's the same. It reads the A, nothing to it, continue to A. Uh, the B comes from the um, secondary config storage. And the C, you read the C and you return the C. So now um, let's look at if we have a changed C, a C prime. So we see the C was the conditional split and now this will hopefully make sense to you. The conditional split gets split off now because it's different than the C that's already exported. Um, and so when we read the, the C, we, we read it from the, uh, the this con uh, secondary storage. So it will be the, the C prime. And, and you see the, the config filter um, behaves um, the same way. So if, if you um, give it a certain amount of conf a certain configuration, you will get the same back when you read it. But what happens on the other side is also consistent. So you, you see like A, B, C prime uh, goes in and A, C comes out for write and the other way for a read. So far so good, right? Good. So how do we use this for making environment specific modules or configuration? Um, so for example, you have the develop module and you don't want the develop module uh, on, on your production site, but the configuration management just is all or nothing. Um, so you would have to disable the, the develop module, then export, and nah, you don't want that. It's a hassle and it's error prone and you do it manually. Um, so you can guess, you do it with configuration split. Uh, you list the module that you want to split off um, and you add the environment specific configuration and then you override which split is active per environment. And if the split is active, the module will be active. If the split is not active when you import it, it's as if the module was not there and therefore will get disabled or um, will not be enabled. Um, another small thing is the, if you want to have environment specific permissions, as you know, permissions are part of roles. And so uh, the easy solution is you, you have like a developer role that you have only on one environment. Um, but then you, you can't just use the, the same users and, and you have to give them an additional role. So there's another module called config role split. Um, the UI for the moment is not great because um, they, to make the proper UIs, uh, <coughs> like how you should be configuring this is not so easy. So right now it's just a, a text area where you uh, essentially post YAML. Uh, it's described on the uh, product, uh, project page. Um, it's also a config filter plugin, so it, it operates in the same way as the config split. Um, and what it does, it's exactly the same as the core extensions and you add and or remove modules. So basically you just add or remove permissions to, to a role. And th this is useful if you want to have, in some environments, additional permissions for um, uh, authenticated users or uh, um, anonymous users. Of course, this split can then also be active or inactive depending on uh, settings of PHP, or you can even split off the role split in another split. So 
you, you can make this uh, as crazy as you want. Um, one of the things that you should keep in mind is when you import the configuration, it will take uh, into account the active um, plugins that Drupal already knows about. So when you import um, uh, a split, like when a split becomes active wh while you import the configuration, this split will not be taken in account already, or this role split. But when you import the configuration again, like a second time, then the split might be active. And so basically for, for every new plugin, um, you, you import the configuration again. So what we usually do is just config import and then review and then everything again and then just run it again and to see um, the message that says nothing has changed and, and all is good. Um, so before we go to the next chapter um, where config split is used, I also want to say a little bit more about configuration management in general because um, as talking with, with some of you um, d during the event, um, a couple of things happen or uh, come up again. And so we use Git for configuration management. Uh, you don't have to, but it's the easiest in, in my opinion. Um, and it's great because the configuration files or the configuration are exported to files which te are text files and Git can handle text files. Um, but there's a little bit more to it and, and you have to be a bit careful sometimes um, with, with configuration management in Git. So this is important for the, a team of developers when um, you, you share the, the repository for both the code and, and the configuration. And um, so how you do that, when you bootstrap a configuration, the first developer um, initializes the repository and installs the site and exports the configuration and adds everything to Git. All the other developers, or all the other environments, I should say, um, they clone the code and they install from existing configuration. That, that may be other developers, that may be production, and that may be continuous integration. Um, so, like you, you install the site instance only once and the first person that makes the first commit is, is the person that does that. And everybody else um, will, will just restart from, from the um, existing configuration, or the, the existing site. Um, so you can have parallel development. Um, you work on your branch and you commit stuff and, and you, you code. Um, you, you do site building, you export configuration, and so on. Um, and it's all file, it's, it's all Git, and, and uh, it all works, right? But uh, you have to be a bit uh, careful with that because Git is just the files, but Drupal needs to import and export. So there's this extra step, and you, you need to follow a couple of rules. Um, and if you're not careful, what can happen is that you lose the uncommit work, uh, you accidentally overwrite um, work done by others, um, or that it looks fine at first, but it's actually not. Um, so here's the safe sequence that the holy grail, the, the rules that you have to follow. Um, sometimes you get away with not following them, um, but then you're in danger. And so this is always safe, this, this, this works. So just to say it, you do your site building, then you export the configuration, you add it to Git, and you commit it. At this point, you have a safe reference. You know this was your site that you just worked on. You, you have it in Git, you can always go back to it. Then you get the code from your colleagues uh, with Git pool, or fetch and merge. Um, then you update the modules as it is specified. So whether you install modules as tarballs or whatever version. You run composer install, for example. Then you run the update hooks. So drush updb or you go to the UI update.php. Then you import the configuration. And once that all worked, you push your commit, and which, which has the, the merge commit in it, of course. So 
if you don't follow these rules, what can happen? If you import the configuration before you export it, all your work is gone. Like, it's, it's gone. I mean, no, no backups. It's, it sucks for you, but you're the one that didn't follow the rules, right? Um, yeah, um, there, there's no help there. Um, if you merge before export, um, that means you, you, you have the, the, the exported code from your colleague, but it's only in the files and not in your database. And so when you export it, it all goes away from your colleague, and the files will, will reflect what you had on your development. Everything works for you, yeah, right? But you actually um, removed all of your colleagues' works. Um, this is not a huge problem. You can solve it with uh, advanced Git knowledge, and you can go back and make a proper merge. But uh, you have to discover it, and you, you have to then fix it. And it's not just Git pull. It's like checking out stuff and making new branches and properly merging them. Um, if you don't do the composer install, um, you may have updated, uh, not updated code. So that can lead to breaking things in several spectacular ways. Uh, if you do not merge, uh, or if you do merge before the commit, then you don't have a, a safe state that you can go back to. And you might have additional manual labor to, to solve uh, conflicts. I, I don't mean necessarily merge conflicts, because those Git will tell you about, but the conflicts we will see in a second. Um, and if you forget to import uh, at the end, then you will continue with the state that you had before and not have all the stuff your colleagues have been worked on. So next time you export the configuration, you're in the same place as before, except some time has passed since, and it will be more difficult to fix it. So, save sequence, remember, right? So, but there's another sequence when you update the modules. Um, so you, you get the new modules with Composer Update, for example. Then you run the update hooks. The update hooks might change the configuration. So you export the configuration again the, with the updated configuration. Uh, you add all of that to Git, and you commit, and you push. Of course, if your colleagues have worked in the meantime, before the push, you, you go back to the other workflow. Um, I think that's all clear, I hope. Um, so I, I was talking about before that you should always run the update hooks before the config import. And like, if you conceptually, the update hooks they're there to fix the database so that it corresponds to your code that you run. And when, when you update code and the database are out of sync, you live in dangerous territory. So the first thing is always update the database. So if you want to abuse the update hooks to do stuff after the uh, config import, um, then you're tempted to do the configuration version for first, and then the update hooks. But you live in this dangerous territory, and there is an issue in Drupal.org that uh, will not allow to to import the configuration when you have outstanding um, updates. Um, and there there is a proof of concept module. Um, it's it's on on GitHub right now that adds a, another hook, like a hook update. As the pre-config import hook and the post-config import hook. And they get fired in a safe environment, as in the code is aligned with the database and everything is fine. And they get called before and after the configuration import. Uh, there's an issue to do that in core, because the other issue is blocked on that, <laughs> essentially. Um, yeah, so maybe that's also one of the things we, we can work on this week. and. Uh, hopefully move on with, with this. Um, right now, you can do both, and often it will work, and, and sometimes it doesn't, and uh, maybe you'll remember this presentation, and remember I told you so. 
So let's see an example of how you can break the configuration with Git. Um, you all know the standard profile, right? So you install the standard profile. Developer A, so you both start from the same um, place. Developer A makes a new branch and deletes the tags field from the article content type. This results in two configuration changes. Basically, it removes two files, the field instance and the field storage because it was the only field instance there was on the site. Great. Commit. Developer B adds the tags to the basic page. That results in another configuration change, which is adding a new file. Um, since these files have nothing in common with each other, Git is very happy to merge this. It's, there is no, no conflict. But now you have configuration that has a, a field instance but without a field storage. And yeah, Drupal will not allow you to import this configuration because the configuration is, is not in a good state. Um, and so always import the configuration and you will notice this. And if you share the configuration often, the, the differences will not be that big and you will probably find out what happened. And the import will tell you what is wrong. It will tell you uh, the, the field instance doesn't have a storage, can't import. And then you go back and say, oh, what happened? Where, where does this storage go? And you see in the other commit, ah, it got removed there. And then you just add it again and, and it's solved. But Git is great for ma managing files and Drupal needs a little bit more care for that. Um, so how do we handle configuration changes on production? I just told you, configuration changes is like development, right? So if you change configuration on production, one could argue that you do development on production. I mean, it's not exactly the same, but your configuration changes, they go in your, in your um, Git repository. And so if, if you change the configuration in production, that should also somehow go into the Git repository. I mean, the, the scenario is exactly the same. Um, so you, you adopt this great model and you have all your developers properly syncing configuration. And then you have your Geeky client that just overnight uh, changes configuration. And so when you deploy, um, all the client's changes go away and because they were not in the Git repository and your client is not going to be happy with you and he's going to yell at you and the client is always right, so you have to take care of that. Of course, the solution that you might know, um, you have someone that clones the database to your local laptop, exports the configuration, puts that in Git and does that. It's, yeah, maybe a bit painful to, to do that, but, but it's a solution. You have like some person that's dedicated to, to be the, the client's developer, so to say. Um, that, that can work if there's nothing in between that goes wrong. So if, like, if, if the client changes something after you export it to the database to your local stuff, it's still gonna be gone. So um, first option, you don't allow the client to do that. Yes. <laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> often, often though, often though, this is not really a solution, and the client has a legitimate use case for changing some configuration. So, this is great, and if you can do it, it will solve you lots of uh, headaches. But sometimes you can't. So there's other solutions too. Coming back to configuration split, because it can also help you out there. Um, so essentially, you you specify which configuration the client can change, with, with what, what is okay for the client to, to do, because the client will not go and, I don't know, change all the, the view settings and cron and, and add fields to everything. And I mean, at that point, the client is really a developer. So, but, you know, maybe the site name can change or things like that. Um, so you, you specify what is okay to change in, in the split settings. Um, for example, the gray list. Then before you deploy, you export that specific split so that your client's configuration is safe. Then you pull the configuration, business as usual, you deploy the configuration with uh, configuration import. And what happens is it will import the configuration from the files that you had, and it will also import this um, second split. 
all good. All configuration is in the files. The, the dogma that the configuration that is in the files re represents the configuration that's on the site after config import is still, is still okay. But you have to do this extra step of exporting. So the third option is with config ignore, which you can skip this, this step. But th like the first, so it's still the same. You decide which config is okay to ignore. Um, then you just pull the configuration and uh, config import. And the configuration is then imported from the files, but also some of the ones that are in the active storage. And uh, it goes in, in into the, um, the magic config filter storage. And nothing will have changed in this configuration. And so it will not get removed. And everything is fine. Um, this is great, but it um, departs a little bit from, from the philosophy that all your configuration is in the files and therefore reproducible and you, you can have like the files and you know when you import it will be the same. Um, but it can, it can be a solution for, for this uh, case. Um, finally, uh, for shared configuration. So if, if you want to reuse configuration uh, or, or use configuration on a multi-site, um, before the last DrupalCon in the US, I wrote a little blog post introducing uh, configuration um, dimensions. So you, you have this vertical dimension of the same site in different environments, and then you have another site, like on, on a horizontal you know, separation. If you were to have the, same, the, the graphics from before, it would be like, a third dimension be between you. So um, this, this is something that core does not um, take care of at all. Um, and you, you can use the same kind of things. I mean, the exporting to files is great and so on. So um, th th there's other solutions. And um, for example, features uh, is useful for, for that. Uh, where you can bundle some of the configuration in, into their own features, into their own modules, and, and reuse them on, on other sites. Um, but once you in install the feature, the site owns the configuration and not the feature anymore. So when you update the feature, you have to make sure that the configuration, that the updated feature then gets re-imported into your site and then the site gets deployed with the normal configuration management workflow as we have. So features is for development only. It's, it's like on the, the lower level on, on, on this uh, dimension. Um, and, but it's great for like starter kits when you have like optionally more features that you want to add. Um, but it, it, it can help you to solve this problem, but it's, um, you have to find a good workaround. Um, for for multi-sites, um, the, the, you can use configuration split. I've used it for all the sites. There's two basic approaches that you can do. Um, one is you have a shared sync directory and then separate splits per site. And the other uh, approach is the other way around, where you have each site has their own sync directory, but you share some of the splits. Uh, which suits best? I, I don't know. It's depending on, on, on your use case. Um, but there will be a buff on Thursday, so you can join us there to, to talk about that uh, a little more. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, join us for the contribution sprint um, on, on Friday, and uh, make sure that you leave uh, some feedback. Um, that always helps to improve the presentations. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have questions, please use the microphone because it will be recorded. Uh, so one common problem is that you don't export before you um, uh, check out something with Git or merge from, from upstream or something. Mm -hmm. um, would it be feasible to either have something that, um, a mechanism that always exports everything, then as soon as someone changes the config, it will be exported? 
or maybe with a cron, like every five seconds they import, export this? Yes, there, there's two modules that do exactly that. Uh, there's config tools, which basically on each save of, of a configuration uh, entity exports it directly. And does so, it have like a um, uh, disadvantage in some way? Well, yeah, it, it does a, a git or it, it does a, like a, a file write on, on every save. Yeah. I mean, but it only writes like one config file, yeah, yeah, not yeah. everything. It, it's not so bad. It, you, okay. you can totally use it, yes. It's, it's a good solution for this problem. OK, it would be maybe a git hook that prevents git from doing anything harmful unless the config is in sync or something? That would also be an option, yeah. Uh, OK. Yeah. But if, if you export it automatically, then, then you will know. I mean, you, if you just pull and then if, yeah. Uh, what is your solution when you are installing site in database you have profile standard but when you export your profile in uh, core uh, in um, configuration you have profile config installer and when someone wants to import changes from uh, configuration if there is a bug then we can't uh, change profile from standard to config installer. No, you, you don't change the profile f to config installer. So when, when you use config installer, it will still be standard that is installed. Uh -huh. OK. It's, so the, the, the way config installer works is it installs another profile. Mm -hmm. And it, it jumps through a lot of hoops to, to do that. And, and uh, that's why there's this issue to, to move this functionality in core, because a lot of things like you know like to, to for example it, it can't handle with, uh, the the case when uh, modules have or profiles have modules in them because then if you install config installer it it can't detect these modules and don't, doesn't find them and and so on okay. but so profile the, it, when you when you install a site with pro config installer the the configuration that you have at the end will not say that the profile was installed with config installer, but with the profile that was installed initially. OK, thank you. Hello. Uh, should notice about uh, features and uh, configurations. Uh, you can use uh, uh, we used uh, features import or features uh, drush features import or features import all uh, when you pull uh, new changes uh, uh, in your feature. Uh, just uh, then run uh, drush uh, import features all, and it solves problem to you know UI to delivery. Uh, yes, but so if if you then change this configuration yourself, then yeah. you know you know you you will have to review this process. Of it's course. it's a. Uh, it uh, and I have a question about uh, uh, situation uh, uh, about uh, importing uh, blocks, uh, you know blocks issue mm -hmm. when you. Uh, Create a block instance uh, in uh, you know DFO production uh, yeah. storage and calculation, and uh, cannot uh, import this configuration because you haven't content. Uh, yes, exactly. So one of the the things that I didn't mention now uh, because I, I expanded the, the other parts of the presentation is is the the issue that you have uh, when uh, configuration depends on content, and the block is like the cano yeah. canonical example for that. So when when you have configuration that depends on content. You, you have to make sure that the, this content also gets in, um, imported. One of the, one of the solutions is, is this, um, the uh, pre-config import hook that I, I talked about. Uh, another solution is you, you implement an uh, event listener that listens to the, con uh, the um, uh, content not found uh, event when, when you import the configuration. I, I forgot the exact name of it, but it's some, something like that. Um, another option is use default content. Um, and, and then have like a, an additional step to, to import and export the, the content that, yeah, that you need. Uh, you can also use deploy, the deploy suite, mm -hmm. for more advanced uh, um, use cases for that. In, okay. in, in our case, we usually use uh, uh, default content, and it works great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi. Um, how can I handle uh, multilingual multi-site with uh, the same feature set but different base languages on each site? So um, the configuration split works with multilingual configuration as well. Um, it it splits the configuration with its languages. Um, what you uh, cannot do right now is override only a specific um, language. 
so I mean you can uh, with the um, like no no you can't really <laughs> I mean but uh, it wouldn't be too difficult to to add another configuration um, filter that only does languages so like the the, the thing is the configuration split works with a separate uh, config uh, storage and so it works the same way and, and that's also how it, it um, deals with languages. It, it natively just supports languages because configuration storages support languages. Um, so if, if you want to only have special uh, languages then, then you need to treat the languages differently than, than the rest of the configuration and it, it shouldn't be too difficult to add another uh, configuration filter that deals languages and saves them somehow in, in, a, in a separate way. Okay. Yeah. But if, if you have questions about, about this, if, like if you're implementing a config filter and I know it can be pretty daunting because it's like a lot of things and, and um, don't, don't hesitate to contact me and I'm, I'll be happy to assist you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Lunch time. You can you can add it retroactively. 